Hello everyone, my name is Svetlana Sakva. I'm a developer advocate for Kotlin. Today we are going to discuss new interesting features that were added to the Kotlin standard library. First, we'll talk about the new functionality that comes with 1.4. Then, I'll illustrate how easy it is now to use this standard library in multi-platform projects. And finally, I'll mention a couple of new experimental things available for you to try. Let's start! I want to highlight several new operations and types, like the running fold and running reduce functions and the array deck class. But before that, I want to talk about the idea of making the standard library consistent and making it meet your expectations. The standard library comes with several naming conventions that you already expect to find there. It's quite convenient that you can rely on the naming convention when you're looking for a function. One of these conventions is the E or null suffix. The standard library contains two groups of functions, the regular ones and the corresponding functions, but with the or null suffix. The first group, the regular functions, return a non nullable value and throw exceptions if something goes wrong. For instance, if a string can't be converted into an integer, or you try to retrieve a value from a collection but the collection is empty, or the required element isn't found in the collection. All these functions return a non-nullable result and throw an exception or an error. These functions have all null counterparts that return null if something goes wrong. We added a couple of new functions uh, of all null functions in Kotlin 1.4. Uh, the random onal is new. It works exactly as, as you expect. It returns either random element or null if the collection is empty. It's really handy to have the consistent naming convention with two groups of functions. By the way, if you find something missing that you expect to be present, please file an issue in our tracker, share this information with us, and we'll try to address this. Next, I want to highlight a couple of important functions that didn't previously conform to the naming convention, the max and min functions. You probably noticed that both of these functions were returning nullable values, and so you would have expected them to have the or null suffix, right? These min and max functions were introduced in Kotlin 1.0. They were there from the beginning. But now they are inconsistent with the whole library philosophy. So we decided to change that. You'll find in your code that in Kotlin 1.4, max and min functions are deprecated. IntelliJ IDEA and Azure Studio suggest replacing them with max or null and min or null functions respectively. These new functions are just synonyms. They behave exactly the same as the old ones. You can apply an automatic quick fix to replace all of the occurrences in your code base. Currently, the old min and max functions are deprecated with a warning. At a later date, they will be deprecated with an error, so you won't be able to use them in your code base at all. Sometime after that, the regular max and min will be returned to the standard library, but following the common convention, the new functions will return not null values and throw exceptions if the collection is empty. We want to provide a very gradual transition to the new functions. It's not a fast process. We don't want to change it all at once and break your code that already assumes they return null rather than throw exceptions. It will take several versions to get to the point where the library contains both max returning a non-nullable value and max or null returning a nullable value. The exact same applies to the max bar and min by functions. We've deprecated them in favor of the new max by or null and min by or null. There is another improvement closely related to the max by and min by functionality. These two functions return the element in the collection that has a maximum or minimum characteristics, respectively. For example, if we want to know the maximum age among a collection of people, we had to do that in two stages. We first get the oldest person using max by, and then get their age. But sometimes we only need the bare value age in our example. In Kotlin 1.4, we added new max of and min of functions to get that value directly. 
max of returns the maximum value, whereas max by returns the element with the maximum value. These new functions follow the convention from the start. They were added together with their counterparts max of or null and min of or null. Min of throws an exception and min of or null returns null if the collection is empty. Another convention that I want to talk about is the indexed suffix. That's also something that you already expect to be working for the many library functions. All the functions for iterating over a collection and performing a given operation on it have counterparts, versions, that additionally take the index of an element for performing an operation. Kotlin 1.4 introduces their own each indexed and flat map indexed functions. In case you're looking at this and wondering what's the difference between for each and on each, here's a quick reminder. For each performs a given action on each element. It's a terminal operation. If you call it on a sequence, it forces the lazy computation to start and returns the result. On each performs the given action on each element but also returns the collection itself afterwards. It's an intermediate operation. You can use on each and on each indexed in the middle of the call chain. If they are used on sequences, they don't force the computation to start. The curious among you might be wondering whether the library can mix these two conventions, or null and indexed. And the answer is yes. And the new function reduce index to null that we added in Kotlin 1.4 is an illustration of that. Reduce analyzes the list and reduces its content to one element using the operation paused as a lambda argument. Reduce or null returns null if the list is empty. Reduce indexed or null complies with both conventions. The lambda argument takes an additional index parameter for reducing the list, and the result is null if the collection is empty. Next, I want to highlight two new functions that we added to the Stearns library running reduce and running fold. These functions are very similar to reduce and fold, which were already present, with the difference that running reduce and running fold return each step of the operation in a list or sequence. Let's look at the diagram and see how it works step by step. In this example, we call reduce and running reduce on the range of numbers from 1 to 5. We are using a range here to demonstrate but this could also be a list or a sequence. For sequences, each intermediate step will be computed in a lazy manner. First, we analyze the first element, number 1. Running reduce already returns as the first element in the resulting list. Then we analyze the second element and combine the first two elements according to the rule that is provided in the lambda. In this case, we sum up two numbers. Running reduce returns this sum as a new intermediate result. Reduce would return nothing at this point, since not all the elements have been analyzed yet. We continue. Running reduce returns intermediate values. Finally, when the collection is over, reduce returns the result. Running reduce returns you all the intermediate steps, with the final result as the last element in the list. That's the difference between reduce and its running counterpart. A similar function is added for fold functionality. Fold is different from reduce. It takes an initial value, while reduce starts analysis with the first element of the list. Running fold is also available by the name scan. The scan name is used in some languages, so it might be more familiar for some people. Scan here is just a synonym. It's another function in the library that only delegates to running fold. You can use whatever you prefer, similar to find and first to null. The difference between fold and running fold is the same as the difference between reduce and running reduce. Running fold returns all the intermediate results, while fold returns only the end result. Running fold, as well as fold, takes an initial value, and it's already the first result. Then it combines an initial value with the first element, that's the second result. As it continues, running fold reports an intermediate result after analyzing each part of the list. 
running fold returns a list or sequence of all the intermediate values, while fold returns only the resulting value. The next topic that I want to cover is a new type, a redec. It's now stable in Kotlin 1.4. It represents a double-ended queue and provides methods for convenient and fast access to the contents from both ends. A redec in Kotlin is a part of the common library, so you can use it in the common code in multi-platform projects as well. If you use Kotlin for JVM, you might have already used the Java Eridec class, which solves the same problem. Kotlin Eridec is a different implementation from the Java one, which is available for Kotlin JS and Kotlin Native as well. Kotlin Eridec implements a mutable list interface because it can at times be convenient. The Eridec implementation uses a resizable array underneath. It stores the contents in a circular buffer, an array, and resizes this array only when it becomes full. When you add a new element to the head of the array, it adds it before the first element, if the space is available, and only moves the head pointer and changes the size. That's why the operation of adding new elements to the beginning works in constant time for most cases. That's much faster than when using ArrayList, which needs to move all the elements to put the first element in the first place. If you need a queue functionality in your code, a data structure that allows you to add elements to the end and retrieve elements from the beginning, use our ArrayDeck implementation. It provides efficient implementation of these methods under the hood. The next topic I want to talk about is the functions for bit manipulation. They've been available for quite a while already, and most of them have become stable in this release. If you write an algorithm that requires bit manipulation, check out this functionality. In this example, we have a binary representation of the number 80. You can count all 1 bits in a binary representation of a number. Or you can count leading or trailing 1 or 0 bits or find the highest one bit, and so on. It's important to have these operations in the standard library. We provide efficient implementations of them, also for Kotlin Native. Please share with us what other bit manipulation functions you'd like to see in the standard library. Next, I want to talk about using the standard library in multi-platform projects. When you write code shared between different platforms, you know you have a common part. This is a common code shared between JVM or JS or Android and iOS. Under the hood, specific versions of the standard library are used for each platform. And there is also the common stdlib that contains many declarations and some common functionality. Platform-specific versions of the standard library only add some platform-specific functionality on top of it. Starting from Kotlin 1.4, the dependency on the standard library is added automatically by default. Before that, you had to include the standard library explicitly to every source set and specify the exact version for each target platform. But now the dependency on the standard library is included by default. It automatically includes the same version of stdlib as the version of the Kotlin Gradle plugin. But of course you can change the defaults if needed. It works not only for multi-platform projects. This dependency is included by default for a regular JVM project as well. But for multi-platform projects, it's especially convenient that you don't have to specify all these different dependencies. One of the goals with the standard library is to make it really useful for multi-platform projects. We want to make it so that the library you're using from the common code is almost the same as the one you're using for, for the JVM, which everyone is accustomed to. To achieve that, we are adding or moving some missing functionality there. For instance, we've moved some methods on String Builder to the common library that previously were available only for the JVM. We've revised the common reflection API, and it now contains only the methods that are available for all the platforms. We added several useful methods for exception processing to the common part, like throwable print stack trace or throwable add suppressed functions. We've also introduced other common throws annotation. Kotlin doesn't have checked exceptions, 
but it allows you to specify them for interoperability with languages that do have checked exceptions or similar constructs. Now, you can specify the exceptions that a given functions can throw in the common code. Then it gets correspondingly represented at JVM for interoperability with Java or in Kotlin native for inter better interoperability with Swift. You can learn more details about how exactly it works for Swift in the talk about Kotlin Multiply from mobile or in the documentation. Finally, I want to go over a couple of things that are currently experimental. Note that in order to use the experimental standard library API, you need to explicitly opt in for that. In other words, you have to swear that you understand all the risks. Whenever you try to invoke an experimental function, you get a warning, and you need to add the opt-in annotation to suppress it. This mechanism was already present in Kotlin, but we've changed the annotation name. Before it was called use experimental, and now it's called opt-in to cover more use cases. It also might be used to annotate unstable or internal APIs, so that you can use them with explicit acceptance of the risks involved. The goal of the opt-in annotation is to make users of the code agree explicitly to use certain elements of your API. As a library author, you might use it to let the community try new features as early as possible, to gather feedback and decide what work works well and what requires some changes. The Kotlin standard library often uses this functionality. Let's say you're a library author and you want to introduce a new API. You can introduce it in a way so that clients of your library would need to explicitly opt in when using this new functionality. For instance, you want to introduce this full class, but you're not yet sure it's final. You want the community to try it first and share feedback from their real-life use cases. You introduce a new annotation, Bleeding Edge API, that says that it's your new API and you annotate new classes and functions with it. You can choose whether the users of the library get warnings or errors when they call this API without opting in for it explicitly. This example deliberately uses the ASCIF symbol of an exclamation mark in the message to emphasize that the compiler will report an error or warning with the, cast with the same custom message. The message can contain the information about what changes you can expect and how stable this API is. To fix the error, the clients of the library should say that they opt in to use this bleeding edge API. They use the opt-in annotation for that. This way, they agree to modify their code if something changes, so they take the risks in order to benefit from the new functionality. A good practice is to provide a clear and automatic migration path if something changes later. In the Kotlin standard library, we try to provide automatic tools for migration to stable versions of the API. Now here is a couple of cool new things in the standard library that are available in experimental mode, collection builders and an API for time measurement. Kotlin divides all the collections into mutable and read-only collections. You choose whether you need one or the other. Sometimes, however, it might be convenient to build your object using mutable interface, but get a read-only collection or map as a result. In Kotlin 1.4, we introduced new functions to the standard library to achieve that – build list, build set, and build map. They follow the same approach that already works for strings. You can use the build string function which operates with a string builder inside and returns an unmodifiable string as a result. Similarly, you can use build list to construct a list. It takes a lambda as an argument with an implicit receiver of the type mutable list. You can add more elements to this mutable list or parse it to another function to be modified, like in the map to call here. Build a list then returns a read-only list as a result. What's more, the resulting list is effectively frozen. It throws exceptions if you explicitly cast it to mutable list and attempt to modify its content. Similar functions are available for constructing sets and maps. The second new piece of functionality I want to describe 
is a set of functions for measuring time. If you need to measure the duration of a specific action, you can use the new measure time function. It returns an instance of the duration class. Duration is an inline class storing the duration is it in a double primitive value. So there is no overhead. In terms of underlying performance, it's the same as using primitive types. And there is no confusion about which unit this duration is expressed in, as often happens when numeric types are used for, for this task. You can then convert the duration to the measurement units you need. You can also explicitly use the time source API to measure time between different events. In our example, thread sleep represents an action. You mark the start moment with mark now, and then call the elapsed now function to get the time passed from the starting point. Elapsed now returns the duration. What's especially convenient here is that, that you do measurements in different places. You can start and finish time measurement in different functions. You simply pass a mark as a parameter or store it somewhere to complete it. Another new handy function is measure timed value. It allows you to get both the duration passed and the result of the computation. It returns a timed value, which can then be automatically destructured into two variables. In our case, a value and duration. The Kotlin Linux date time library provides an API for working with dates and times. To learn more details about it, check out the introducing date time talk by my colleague Ilya Gorbunov, also the author of many of the standard library changes we've discussed today. We've covered a lot of things today. New functionality in the standard library, available in Kotlin 1.4 release, naming conventions, new running fold and running reduce functions, new type array deck, operations for bit manipulation, using standard library in multi-platform projects. It includes more functionality now and there is no need to include the dependency on it into each source set. And we've discussed some of the experimental things available for you to try, collection builders and time measurement API. If you want to re read more, check out what's new on the Kotlin 1.4 documentation page. It contains a section about the standard library with more details about the functionality we've discussed today. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice Kotlin!